do you want to sort of make me um, co-host again? Just yeah, so I can yeah, of course. Just to uh, so. to the participants. Pauline, make co-host there. I've just made you co-host. Um, and Jen, you disappeared again. Um, well, I'm sorry, I muted myself. Okay, well, <laughs> I'm going to, um, I'm pinning you, so they are, I, I, that sh you should be pinned by now. Hey, Linda, can you make me co-host really fast so I can hit record? Yeah, who's, who's, who's just said that? Oh, me, Hillary. Hillary. Oh, hi, Hillary. <laughs> uh, sorry, I was able to hit record. Oh, are you? I okay. Yeah. okay, thanks. You still want to make to make your co-host, Hillary? And no, I'm good if she's got it. Okay then. Thank you. All right. Sorry, everyone. We're just yay. We're professional volunteers. <laughs> we're volunteers, but we're professional ones. Right. Okay. So um, I'm going to introduce Jen. Um, this is Jen LeBlanc. Um, I'll introduce it by what you submitted yourself to say about yourself and your talk, which sounds really, really interesting. We've had a great start already with t so I'm sure it's going to continue. So Jen is an artist, teacher, Galdrakona, shamanic practitioner and healer. Um, and she says that she, she facilitates commun communion with individuals and their natural surroundings through their spiritual voice. Born and raised in the ancient mountains of Vermont, which is in the USA for those of us who aren't in the USA. Um, all I know about Vermont was, this, it was the film White Christmas. Um, she... The only thing I know about Vermont is this is the film White Christmas. Oh. Um, uh, Jen utilizes all forms of vocalization to find the tones that open gateways and call in the spirits of the land, which is fascinating. Focusing on resonance, her formal education from the University of Vermont, it was in integrated biological science, anthropology and forensics, wow, which allows a scientific perspective um, to explore the landscape, utilizing cutting edge physics and biological theories. Jen embodies the intersection of spirituality and science, a union that she says is needed for a cohesive worldview. And the title of Jen's talk is Gelder Sound and Silence. So I'll say, yeah, and so I'm opening over to you. Thank you. Thank you. That's very exciting to be here. <laughs> I remember last year when I came to the conference, it was like life changing for me. So to speak, this year is kind of a big deal. I'm going to share my screen. I shared um, my references because I have so many references that I drew from that I didn't want to um, place them all in the presentation. I feel like visually that's overwhelming. I probably missed a few because there's like 40 or 50 in there. Please just contact me if you can't find one or figure out where I got some crazy idea. I will happily direct you to it. Let me share my screen. So. There we are. Can everyone see it? Get a yes. nod. Thank yeah, you. Yes, we can see it. Yep. <laughs> Gotta move all your heads. I play a game of hide the heads the whole time I'm presenting, which is very funny. Let's get this guy up and going. Okay, so Golder Sound and Science, the weaving of animism through resonance. So essentially, I'm going to take you on a little journey. Um, I have some spirituality. I have a lot of science because I'm a huge nerd. If that didn't come through with the bio, I really love science, maybe a little too much. Um, and just some personal experiences. So it's like a little journey to where I got where I am. <laughs> so my animistic worldview, um, I think in America, we have a very simple concept of animism. And I just want to weave in what my perspective of animism is as we go on in the presentation. So I call it modern versus indigenous. Uh, animism has become an umbrella term with really a, a variety of perceived meanings. If you ask different people what it means, you're probably gonna get a variety of different answers. 
And again, like I said, in America, people tend to say it just means things have a soul. It means beings are animated, they're conscious, they're sentient. And that's kind of where the conversation ends. That's like, full stop, they have a soul, moving on. And I really feel like we're losing a lot of the conversation. To me, that perception is kind of limited by uh, anthropomorphism, but it really is initiatory, right? It's a, an important step in understanding the full conversation. Like I said, we could not possibly exemplify the rich, profound web of interconnectedness with one word, right? So for me, animism is a way of experiencing the world in a unified and holistic manner. It acknowledges the unique experiences of other non-human beings. It's a close relationship and reverence for nature and is infused with conscious equality. And that's a really important part in my opinion. We are engaged in a conscious stance of attunement with everything that exists. So animism is the weaving of reciprocity and the intimacy of that connection. And on a fundamental level, and as we move through these slides, I hope that comes through, it is a feedback loop of vibrational input and response, a highly complex and continuous relationship between beings and fundamentally symbiotic. And again, I should have like underlined that or put it in big letters because that's like the big take home for me. Okay, my personal experience, I almost took these out but I decided I had to leave them in to really give you a good foundation of the weird being that I am. So. I moved uh, into my current home, a cute little apartment in Vermont, which by the way, I actually call the Shire of the United States. That's probably why you haven't heard of us because we like it that way. So we hide in our little hog holes. But I moved here and I am next to a river and I started cleaning it um, because I loved it and I wanted it to be clean. And after a few years, I learned what I was told was Galder at the time singing and using my voice as a way of reverence and connection. So I started singing to it as well. Now this is a river that I was very familiar with. I had been visiting for years and years. The rocks, I was very, I had collected rocks. I'd paid attention to every part of it. And one day I was sitting there with my partner and I said out loud, I've never found a hagstone, but I would love to. I really would love to. And I reached down and picked one up. Well, that's handy. <laughs> of course, and I'm sure a lot of people are like, yeah, I've had that happen. But I found 13 that day like I didn't just find one and I remember I was really familiar with this bank at this point I have found over 50 at least many different rivers it becomes an inside joke how long it takes Jen to find a hagstone whenever I go to a new river and this was the first clue that there was a communication going on um, I heard it referenced as a spiritual two by four so right upside the head we tend to be a little bit stubborn sometimes and not pay attention to messages from spirit and sometimes they have to really hit us hard with some information for us to sort of pay attention, right? I'm sure, again, people are nodding, right? They're like, yeah, of course. So this was my first spiritual two by four in the little journey that we're on now. So I really had to pay attention after I found that many and it piqued my scientific and spiritual curiosity. So I had questions, of course, can I verbally communicate with non-human entities? Did I really just communicate to the river? What does science have to offer in this quest? And is there an intersection of science and spirituality that offers me answers? What do non-human beings sound like? So I really started paying attention to how everything sounds. Now, I didn't want the other beings to have to communicate with me. I was trying to facilitate a way of me communicating with them through their language. Could I find a language? So what do both organic and inorganic matter have in common? How can they both communicate? And I came to vibration, frequency, and sound, of course. And then I became unnecessarily obsessed with all types of sound, uh, much to the chagrin probably of my partner and family, because I will now tell you that I attempted to mimic these sounds. And I know that sounds insane. And as I show you some of them, we're gonna, you're gonna hear a lot of things in this presentation. You might think that would be insane to do or try, but I do suggest it. You can make a wide variety of sounds, probably more than you realize. So we have the cacophony of sounds. Now, please, someone tell me right away if you can't hear them. But I did click on this, the hear sound uh, thing. This is solar radiation waves converted to sound waves. So this is the sound of the sun. very, very 
very scary. So this, oh, it jumped ahead. So this is actually the sound of mushrooms. So the bioelectric sounds inside the mushrooms as they are growing were amplified. This is actually a really cool uh, art installation where people coming into the room like turned it on. And so as they entered, it became a room full of sound. I wish I could play for you the entire video. We'd be here forever. So this one you have to prepare yourself for. If you've never heard the bearded seals, it is loud. It is not what you would expect. This is a mating call. It's fairly impressive. I think I'd respond to this. Renee? But again, like to point out that I have a very patient family. Um, it's always hard to switch slides. Give me one second. It never wants to let me go to the next slide when I have two videos. There we go. So here we have a plant. Now that is very interesting. Again, it's the bioelectrical signals being amplified on the inside of the plant. This is an Arduino. You can actually buy a similar item, that, but it'll turn it into music. So since this has happened, they've created this. You can get the little biosensors applied to your plants and it actually plays music. But I prefer the weird sounds inside the plant itself. I'm gonna fast forward at one point in the video, the person touches the plant and it's very fascinating that the sound changes. So it's really curious. Yeah, so sit with that one for a little while. Now, here's the question. How was that plant? Was it a positive response or a negative response? Was it, ooh, thank you, I sent you, or was it, my goodness, stop touching me? There's no way for us to really know, but it is very interesting. Okay, next slide. Come on, let me through every time. So my only, yeah, uh, here we go. So these are planets. So now we're going out into the cosmos. Electromagnetic vibrations mapped as sound. Okay, I'm gonna show you a few. Again, we can't listen to the whole thing because it would take forever. My presentation would go on for hours, but I wanna save Saturn for last because for some reason, Saturn sounds so vastly different than everybody else. It's hilarious. We'll bounce around. Saturn. I don't know. It sounds like Saturn's just screaming through space. I just think Saturn, who hurt you? Like what is happening to you out there? Something about those rings. All right. So I did this for quite a long time. I really was researching sound, the different sounds that nature and the cosmos had to offer me, trying them out. And again, my partner is very patient, trying them out in nature. 
So I'm gonna condense this down to my tiny little major two by four awakening. After a while of doing this, I was in a forest one day and we have a lot of mines and old abandoned mines in Vermont. So they're great places to find cool rocks if you love cool rocks. And I was searching for one. I did find it, it was disappointing, but I heard a lot of sounds in the forest and I started mimicking and toning and you know, offering my voice to this conversation. And I noticed some cicadas getting what I assumed was fairly annoyed with me uh, and just like going off and then more went off. And then suddenly the entire uh, forest exploded into cicada. It was deafening. It was just like so loud. And my poor partner was like, what are you doing? Please stop, <laughs> let's just do this. Okay, we'll go to a new floor. We'll go to a new place, another local mine. And I was practicing my cooning, uh, which I'm trying to learn all these different vocalizations. And someone started answering me back, which I found hilarious. So I'm calling, they're answering back, I'm calling. I thought someone was messing with me, so we were playing a game. And then I noticed that it was coming from different directions too. So now there's like three or four people. No, there's not. That's when I realized I had called a pack of coyotes and they were getting closer and closer and closer. So again, my poor partner, I'm sorry, we have to leave because I don't know what I just said to them. So like, let's go, sorry. <laughs> very patient. Now this last one's more interesting. So it's the next day, I think. So this all happened really, really quickly together, right? Uh, I went to a waterfall and I'd visited that waterfall before. And I, I'm kind of known as the river singer around Vermont. I just, I love singing to the rivers. But this time, for some reason, I decided to turn and face the waterfall. And I started singing and toning and doing my thing at a waterfall. And at one point, I definitely felt this profound somatic shift in my body. Uh, which was notable. And then my voice changed and became a different kind of vibrant frequency. Then it seemed to blend with the sound of the waterfall and created a whole new sound. Now I knew I wasn't making that sound and it was getting louder and louder and louder, um, which kind of freaked me out, I'm not gonna lie. I'm very loud, I know this, but this was louder than I could physically produce. So I knew something was happening and eventually I just got freaked out and stopped. Um, but that really was the largest two by four. I could not ignore this anymore. And I really had to do some research. So let's think about sound. A side note, I actually had, I have been a science teacher for like seven years. So you're going to get a whole, we're going to run it down. Here's some basic information about sound. If you don't remember or never knew. Sound is a vibration. It propagates as an acoustic wave through a medium. A medium is soil, air, water. Sound is actually also a form of energy, just like electricity and light, phonons for light is a unit of electricity. And sound is made when molecules vibrate and move in a pattern called waves or sound waves. This is, and I don't have my pointer on yet. I love my little pointer. So this is cymatics. So if you, I don't have time to explain that, you can Google that for fun later. So basic sound qualities, we have the amplitude, which is the volume, we have the frequency, which is the pitch, and the wavelength, which is the speed. Now, this is kind of basic stuff, but here's where I'm going with this, and I love this so much. So we have the amplitude, and here's our wave, up and down, of course, and the air molecules are actually responding. So matter is responding to the wave. As you reach the top of the wave, it compresses the air molecules, and as you reach the bottom of this wave, they release. And so every peak and flow of sound waves, matter is responding. Gotta love science. So evolution of sound and hearing. The first primordial sounds on earth were stone and wind and water and lightning. And we have a primal auditory invitation every time we experience them today. Four billion years of history are coming at us when we stand outside and experience a lightning storm or on top of a mountain and the wind just deafens. But for 3 billion years, life, organic life was actually fairly silent until the first cilia appeared. And if you remember from high school bio, the cilia are these funny little hair-like extensions that come off cells, right? So this is a little bacterium. He's got all his little cilia. Over here on this side, this is a human ear. And we have all these cilia lining the inside. Don't worry, I'm getting to something. So these wiggly structures 
helped the first eukaryotic organism swim, move, gather food. This was a big evolutionary advancement, right? It allowed them to sense vibrations in their environment and process those vibrations within their cell bodies because they extend into the cell body. As their aquatic ancestors evolved, these cilia diversified and eventually they found their way into our ears. Not only our ears, we have them in our heart and our eyes. We have them in all over our bodies and inside there and all the other animals on earth and all the things that evolved from these single cell organisms have utilized these cilia in different ways. It's interesting that 24 weeks, a human fetus develops the hairs that turn in, tune into low frequencies first, the sounds of the womb, the sounds of the deep earth, because the earth, the sounds that it produces are very, very low. High frequencies do mature later. And I couldn't say this better. So David Haskell just came out with a new book. It is amazing. You should read it. Even in adulthood, the hair cells of our inner ears are bathed with fluid. We keep a memory of the primal ocean womb inside the coils of our inner ear. Deep inside, we listen as aquatic beings. I know this isn't, this is quite a lot. This is the tree of life, right? As we know it now. And here we go. And here's everything I'm about to talk about all the way up there. These are the structures that our ancestors brought with them when they walked onto land. So this is a deep evolutionary history that we're utilizing now to communicate with the land. All the structures within our ear evolved in tandem with similar sensory systems in every relation in our branch of the family tree. Our ability to speak followed a similar path. Although the expressions unique to each, so we all, everything vocalizes differently, every vertebrate animal shares the same embryonic origin of vocalization. So a section of the nervous tissue at the intersection of the hind brain, we're in the back of the brain now, and the spinal column develop into the circuit that controls sound. Now, if you know a little about brain development, these big old burly chunks in the front or frontal lobe are the they're more recent development, right? That's kind of what makes us us. Our big old obnoxiously constantly over-processing everything frontal lobe. Back here, people call it the lizard brain. You'll hear it called that. This is the first part of our brain that ever developed. So the region of the spine that orchestrates vocalization also coordinates the action of the pectoral region. So we're talking about the chest, right? Movement of our bodies. This connects vocalization with sound, rhythm, and movement. So in vertebrates, both hearing and sound production is linked to movement. So when we sing, beat a drum, and move simultaneously, we are invoking sense and sensation that is woven within ancestral and embryological roots. Who I love that. Singing, listening, chanting, drumming, and dancing link us back to our single celled ancestors and connect us to the primal earth in a fundamental and sinuous way. <clears throat> Let's talk about this. Originally, when I had this slide up, it was just to show what we can do. And then I realized what it really shows is what we're missing. So human beings can hear in an auditory field from about 20 to 20,000 hertz frequencies. And of course, as you get into ultrasounds, higher frequencies, we've got our cats and dogs. And I realized this guy looks like he's literally wound for sound. And the little pace on him is hilarious. And as we move up into, I didn't realize that until like right before this presentation, I was like, wow, that guy. And we have bats and dolphins, right? And they're very impressive. They're up to like 160,000 Hertz. But what's interesting and not a lot of people know is we have infrasound, right? So elephants, moles, the lower tones that we cannot pick up are being utilized by animals as well. And this is just the animal kingdom, the basic animal kingdom. You can imagine it spans out as we get much, much higher and much, much lower other things are giving off those frequencies and we just can't hear them. We're missing that conversation. So we'll talk about elephants for a second because I emphasize that. Only a few more slides of this direction. Lower than 20 Hertz, it's the base of their skull, the base of their trunk into their skull. Vibrations are amplified by the honeycomb design. I will show you a picture, don't worry, because it's cool. 
airborne, it can be heard two to three miles away. But underground seismic waves can be perceived up to 12 miles away by other elephants. 12 miles, they can hear each other communicating. It travels through their toes and up into their ear. So matter sensory reception. So they have special cells that can pick up the vibrations and transmit that information. And that is a very cool honeycomb looking. It took me forever to find this picture, just so you know. So bask in the honeycomb structure of the elephant skull. It really took a lot of Googling. And one more tiny thing. And a lot of these, it's all, all the articles and things are in those references. So if you're like, what is she taught? I need to know more. You can usually find them in there. Acoustic developmental programming is a really new thing that's coming up. Science, this branch of science is starting to figure out that increasing studies recognize across many taxa, developing embryos are actually listening. And not only are they listening, they're responding through changing their development. Sounds and vibration from the parents are directing this. So embryos have shown immediate adaptive responses to external sounds and vibrations. So they're not just little chunks of cells until they fully form and hatch. They are engaging. Humans, birds, insects, reptiles, amphibians are all doing this. Things like hatching early because there are predators, changing the transition times of certain parts of development. There's so much more going on sound wise than we ever could have imagined. But what about the waterfall? Okay, so that was a lot of organic talk, right? So what about the waterfall? What do both organic and inorganic matter have in common? And that brought me back to vibration, frequency, and sound, right? Now we have to go to physics. I warned you there was a lot of science in this. It was science, sound, and some culture, right? <laughs> so you've got to get a lot of science. You'll get used to it from me. This is a really dense description. So the definition of resonance, just basic physics, is the state of a system in which an abnormally large vibration is produced in response to an external stimulus occurring when the frequency of the stimulus is the same or nearly the same as the vi natural vibration frequency of the system. There are a lot of words in that. Let's sum up. Acoustic resonance is a phenomenon in which an acoustic system amplifies sound waves whose frequency matches one of its own natural frequencies of vibration. So here's the question. Did I match the natural frequency of the waterfall? Unintentionally, I'll give you that. It's interesting, but this brings us to consciousness. Now, this is a huge debate. Could it be conscious? So Tam Hunt, and we're gonna to get to this theory late in a little while. I'm not gonna leave you hanging with this. The oscillation of actual entities is resonance and the shared resonance is what results in the combination of consciousness. Wow, didn't I love this <laughs> when I was trying to figure out what was going on. So the hard problem of consciousness, if you start looking into this, or if you have looked into it, you will find this the hard problem. What physical entity, where does consciousness originate? And no one can figure this out or agree. In big letters, I have put science never collectively says anything. So this is really important. I hear a lot of people using the phrase science says, and every time nails on chalkboard, ah. Science argues among itself as much as the heathen community debates like every detail of everything. It really does. All of the branches of science are always arguing with each other and all of the scientists in every branch pretty much disagree and debate with each other all the time. So it's just really important to understand when we talk about science and applying scientific information. Right now, consciousness lacks a universally accepted operational definition, which already puts us in a weird place of understanding it. And as I said, it's hotly debated. So there's so many different theories right now, but most of them, in my opinion, erroneously pos position humans as a supremely conscious being that all other entities must be compared to, right? We are the big brains and everyone else must reflect us. That immediately creates a biased system that favors only that which mirrors our own perceptions of consciousness, right? So we're creating a little bit of bias because we're people and we do that. I'm not gonna say we don't, it's very human. And I don't presume to have all the answers. I'm just gonna present this theory and I hope it makes sense why it weaves into everything beautifully. So a scientific definition of consciousness is that a, a system in which 
there was a cycle of input stimulus and output response. There was a feedback loop of information and response, right? Alfred North Whitehead, now this gets really dense, described it as an oscillation between subjective prehension and objective concrete sense. So essentially every entity goes through a cycle of sensing its environment and then deciding how to manifest the next moment, right? Makes sense. Now I'm front loading a lot of info before we get to this theory. So just basic information about quantum theory, vibrations and frequencies, okay? Quantum field theory defines that all matter is essentially vibration in quantum fields. All things vibrate or in constant motion. That's just a basic fact, we know this. Even stationary objects are vibrating and we tend to forget that. Everything is vibrating and moving, and oscillating at various frequencies. And all objects and mechanical systems have a natural frequency at which they vibrate. My favorite, they may even have many natural frequencies depending on their geometry. So some things have unique geometries that offer multiple different natural frequencies. Yeah, that's awesome. And I wanted to throw in here because I love the idea of indigenous science, which really well rounds it all before we jump in. And Dr. Leroy Little Bear, I wanted to give him some props, a celebrated academic at Blackfoot, describes the native paradigm in indigenous science with several key points. Constant motion or flux, everything consists of energy waves. Energy waves are really spirit. And we are made of energy waves or a combination thereof. So the resonance theory of consciousness. That's a lot of front loading. So this is Tam Hunt and Jonathan Schooler. It was 2019 that it came out. And a lot of people have been very excited about it ever since. And I'm sure some people disagree with it completely, but that's okay. Synchronous vibrations or resonance are not only the foundation of human consciousness, but general physical reality. So this is the theory. Uh, resonance is a type of motion or oscillation between states. We've already agreed on that. And as two vibrating objects come into proximity, they can begin to vibrate at the same frequency, right? Here's where it gets really interesting. At higher levels of consciousness, right? Directed, directly related to the levels of complexity of the entity. So at the atomic level, each atom or even subatomic particle, because there's some people looking into that, they can experience a limited consciousness, a rudimentary consciousness. But as we layer and become the macro conscious beings that we are, every level, every micro consciousness layers into the macro consciousness that we experience. Subatomic particles are constantly engaging with each other and responding to that engagement. We know they're doing this. There's that feedback loop we talked about. As I just, I kind of jumped ahead on slides, I tend to do that. So this really results in that macro conscious experience. Every system, we have atom to molecule to cell. This is just our body, right? To cell, to organ, to organ system, to a full body, not to mention all the little critters we have inside of our body and living on us. So this, in the theory of resonance, the resonance theory of consciousness, is what creates our really interesting macro conscious experience. So it's literally the resonance of our engagement with everything else within us. Biological systems are just easier to comprehend for us. It does not invalidate other entities. Limits our understanding, I said before, when we expect everything to be expressed as a mirror of us. So, sum that up. Every component, every level of existence is participating in a feedback loop of existence and response. So there is some science, and I did put it in the references. Electrons have rudimentary consciousness. That is a really exciting new direction. Galaxies are interact interacting with other galaxies. And so now we're seeing, we're starting to understand on the larger scale, how these large celestial bo bodies are interacting with each other and responding. If we're only searching for that which mirrors our own expression, we're missing most of the conversation. We're missing almost all of it, right? One of the most compelling outcomes of the process of science is that we tend to find what we seek. But let's head in a vastly different direction. So. <laughs> You know, let's change directions completely because at this point you're all wondering what I'm going to start talking about gold, right? Will you get to it, please? I know, but there was important information. So I know I have friends that love the etymology. Now at this point, I get I can say all those big science words, and I start getting a little nervous about pronouncing some of the, the language that is not my own. So please, if you want to correct me, jump in. 
Okay, the Old Norse word Galdr is derived from. There's several possibilities and choices, right? We have Gala, which is Old High German, that's singing incantations. We have Gjaldr, or Galdr, I'm guessing, spell enchantment and witchcraft. And the verb Galen, is what I'm guessing, means sing or chant. In Icelandic, we have Ad Gala, to sing, call out, or yell. And my personal favorite, we have Dutch, Gillen is to yell and scream. Right, so this describes a number of different things. Some references are a sing-song method, and some are just loud yelling to harness diamistic energy. I mean, that's amazing. I love doing that. So essentially, if you're not familiar with Galder, it's the use of vocal expression and incantation to manifest a desired outcome, right? It is considered one of the primary components of Seder, and it would take me a whole other presentation to really flesh out all of the details of that. So I chose not to because I was pushing an hour when I clocked this thing. So the, often the two are intertwined in the sources. And so when you read about Seder and Galder, you, you tend to see them together. And sometimes it's hard to differentiate which is which. It's one of the primary components. So both are a form, considered a form of sorcery or magic, utilized during the Iron Age. And of course, late Iron Age in Northern Europe primarily is what we're looking at. Heading into the Middle Ages, the term actually becomes a little bit blurry and is sort of used to describe generally just magic. So that gets even more complicated when you're looking into Galder. So I ran out of a lot of pictures, but I didn't want to steal a lot of people's artwork. So people practicing, so you'll notice a the theme. The limited descriptions that we have about what it sounded like indicated that it was a high-pitched singing that was pleasing to the ears. Um, I get challenged here because it's difficult to say, does that represent most Galder? Or does that represent the small amount of Galder that the person who documented it heard? Right, so this gets tricky. How do we know? Um, even the music of the Viking Age has sort of been lost to time, right? We're, we're reconstructing it now. There's a really cool article, again, in the references section about that. So of course, uh, Galder itself is proposed to follow incantation meter. So a style of writing, a meter of incantation writing and called Galdrolag, which utilizes tennings, alliterations, lifts, syllables. Hmm. Leo the I believe I got that one right. It's really, really complicated. And again, it would probably take me about 30 minutes to even really explain adequately what that is. So you'll have to come to my next presentation. <laughs> you like how I did that? So modern, I wanted to bring up modern runic toning because this actually is how I was introduced to the concept of Galder. And I honestly don't know if this is happening around the world or is it really one of those American things that we just kind of do over here. But I do believe it's happening in some, but like uh, runic John does it and things like that. So I don't know where it came from originally. I've been trying to figure that out. It's a very modern form and it's typically called Galder. Use that as you will. Some people might like that, some people might not. I'm sure there's a variety of feelings about that, but it's essentially toning the rune names and it's toning specifically the elder Futhark rune names uh, to connect with their energy, to do workings. And it tends to use elongated tones, especially those vowel tones. And so it draws them out. And it reminds me of the ancient Egyptian temple singers and the description of how they would tone vowel sounds and it would become sacred sound. Humming and toning itself is a wonderful act. So in and of itself, this is already a wonderful way to connect with those energies. Scientifically and in a healing way, it releases nitric oxide, calms the nervous system. Your blood cells need nitric oxide to deliver oxygen. So literally your body relaxes, your blood oxygenates, your nervous system is regulating when you're doing these things. And that really allows you to deeply connect with the energy of the runes. So again, I would like to know if people are doing this everywhere else. I can't read the, the chat while I'm doing this, where I get super distracted and then I go on a tangent for like a half an hour. So we'll, we'll check in after. Uh, Galder and the Edison sagas, of course it comes up and I'm gonna mention a few ways that it does. Grogalder is a very famous one, Gro is a volva summoned from beyond the grave by her son. Uh, she helps him in his bridal quest by casting nine Galder spells for him. Uh, Galder is proposed to be used to force Gerder to marry Freyr. And of course, the most famous, I think, probably, is the list of magic sons in Havamal. 
We have verses 146 to 163 that outlines 18 golders, but of course not how they were sung. I feel like it's kind of Odin just sort of boasting that he can do it. These are my golders, but I'm not going to tell you how. No, thank you. You're going to have to figure it out on your own. Good luck. And of course, the saga of Eric the Red with the troop of singing girls. Now, some people say it's to awaken the powers of the vulva. I think that a lot of people would give a variety of um, opinions about what they were doing. And I do know that particular technique is still used today by some vulvas. So in the Edison sagas, it tends to um, come up and be used in a variety of ways to make childbirth easier, bringing madness and chaos and causing harm, of course, depending on what time period, if you're heading more into the Christian time period, of course, it's more about cursing. But masters of the craft are said to be able to raise storms, sink ships, affect weapons, affect armor, and really win the battles. Now, all of these things are amazing and epic. They are less useful now. Uh, if I ever have a battle that involves these things, I hope that I will be able to go there. But I feel like now we're looking for what, what do we want to use this power for? And how do we change the sound and how do we change the Galder log to reflect that, right? So just so you know that I have them all, I wanted to show you them, a few of the references. So at 145, we have these songs. I'm not going to read them all. These songs I know, which nor sons of men nor queen in the king's court knows. The first is help, which brings the help in woes and in sorrow and strife. These are kind of hard to read. A second I know, which the sons of men must sing who would heal the sick. And it goes on and on. And there's quite a few of them, but they're very, very cool. So I suggest if you have not read them to go check it out, we'll read the entire half of them all, but you know, I'm a little biased. So in the saga, I just picked one, Frithiaf Saga. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. I hope I didn't butcher it. I just mentioned that after that, they sent for two witch wives, Heidi and Hamglom, which is for me, I'm sorry, that's kind of a funny name, and gave them money to raise against Frithiof and his men so mighty a storm that they should be lost at sea, basically. So they sped the witch song and went up on the witch mound with spells and sorcery. And it does mention after that there fell on them a great wind and storm, an exceedingly heavy sea. Uh, they were lucky they did not sink. Spoiler alert. But what I found interesting about this passage, it talks about a witch mound. So a geological feature now that they are engaging with, with their sorcery. They went to the witch mound to engage in the sorcery. And I hear this and I couldn't find a good reference for it, but I've heard that and read it in various places that like Golder and this type of work say there is done uh, on, a, on a mound, on a rock, on a hill, mountain, cliff. So the actual sound, I really hope you didn't come hoping that I was gonna tell you what Gulder sounded like. Um, because I'm very disappointed now. This is a really, if you have information, I would love to open that conversation. And I think we all need to keep talking about this for us to kind of find it again. But unfortunately, there's really not a solid record of what it authentically sounded like. Again, if I'm wrong, please tell me, I appreciate it. It's up to the practitioner to find their own unique song and sound based on the limited sources that we have and experience, right? We are all finding our way through this. In my opinion, bread and, and through my experience, this is what I did, breadcrumbs can be found in the sounds and vocals of indigenous traditions all over the world. I went a little circumpolar on this one because I think it is important to see how other cultures are engaging with the land. What are they doing? How do they sound? Uh, many of these traditions were used to speak to nature in some way. So to sum up, Galder for me. In my humble opinion, okay, Galder is the use of the human voice as a tuning fork to comprehend and eventually translate the vibratory expression of all human and non-human relations. And eventually, with practice, it can become a method of directly influencing that relational experience. So over time, you will learn to alter things with it, right? Galder Log is a very effective and complicated incantation meter. A foundational vibrational vocal connection was a driving force in many ancient animistic relationships. Galder is a union of both the sound and the meter to drive the power of the magic. And as practitioners, we must find our way back to that resonant connection 
for our vocal magic to embody its full power. I actually thought about removing these the, the vocal traditions and people got very upset with me. So we are gonna go on a little tour of some of the vocal traditions that I'm talking about. I told you, it's all about sound. Of course, we're gonna talk about cooling, which is the herding call Scandinavian music form, traditionally used to call livestock and, and speak to animals and nature, draw them down from the high mountain pastures they've been grazing. It was used a variety of different ways. But it involves high pitched shouts between 780 and 1570. That is high pitch. It's very impressive. Uh, it's described as ornamented and in a minor scale. It has a very distinct sound. Some of the old recordings actually display lower pitches. And so I think, again, it limits us when we assume it's all high pitch, the tradition's all high pitch. It is the ability of the person doing it, right? So we can all do that. I do have little videos. I will only do very short ones because we run out of time. I like this middle section. Love the cows. I can't help it. I have to. <laughs> That's my favorite part is when all the cows come running and the wonderful cow bells. And the... So, of course, we have Yoiking and the Sami people of Northern Europe. I feel like these two first ones, probably most people in um, this particular group will have heard of. Yoiking is used to express relationships to people in nature, uh, communing with the earth. It had few to no lyrics and sometimes animal calls. So, the Noadis, the Sami shaman, would perform the Yoik while beating a drum to connect to the spiritual world. I have two, I couldn't decide and no one could help me decide. So we have two recordings. And this is, these are recordings from the fifties. One more, uh, the Sami singers at Standing Rock. I was just so, it was just so beautiful that the Sami came and represented at Standing Rock. So I wanted to give these ladies props. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, throat singing is obviously something that's done in various parts of the world, but I wanted to, I'm really trying to represent a lot of different places. So I went to Canada and the Inuit in Canada. So we are Nunavut is a large uh, northernmost territory. And this uh, tradition is very, very, very important to them. There's deep emotional significance to this sound. And it was used to imitate the sounds of nature and animals. Uh, these two ladies are very, very young, and I really appreciate them keeping this tradition alive. And part of this, my understanding, is that they, it's always done with two people. They are always facing each other, and they are always have interlocking arms. So that's a really beautiful part of this tradition. <laughs> Okay. Again, I wish I could play them all for you, but 
Okay. We'll run out of time. Yeli, of course, you have to go to Africa because there's some beautiful traditions out of Africa. The Baca people is the central African rainforest. Uh, they, it's signified by polyphonic vocal choirs. Uh, several melodies sung simultaneously. It's distinctive yodeling technique. Uh, typically, the women sing the song and the men dance it. Mm -hmm. Skip to kind of the, the center here so you can see some of the, the kids learning the dance. Uh, this is this song just has so much joy. love those kids dancing again it's just so much joy in that video it's hard not to and the last one we're almost there Kume, if you're not familiar originated in western mongolia in the ulta mountains it imitates the sounds of nature uh, simultaneously emitting two distinct sounds so it's a low continuous drone and um, a variety of harmonics over that uh, two-tone singing it's believed to have been learned from birds. So it is believed that they were taught to do this by birds. So if you ever questioned how many unique things you can do with your voice, I hope I changed your mind right there. I want to talk about acoustic archaeology really quick because this is really cool and I'm very, very excited about the direction it's going. So essentially what's going on is that they're starting to figure out in a lot of these sacred sites where there's carvings and there's images that are left behind from pre sometimes prehistoric people. They're starting to analyze those areas through sound. And they're finding that most of these areas have some kind of sound significance that we were missing for a very, very long time. So you can look up acoustic archaeology, archaeoacoustics. There's a lot of different ways this is presented. Um, but literally, sound reverberates through time and space based on geologic features and gives life to deities and voice to the land in a very unique way. So now we are reevaluating them, the connection between the visual representation and the emphasis on the spiritual sound to the ancient people. And it's being um, viewed as intangible cultural heritage. It's very, very important. And I'm very excited that people are doing this work because it's connecting us to this ancient earth in a way that we couldn't before. Now, I really am not sure how to say this. And I actually tried to find videos where someone was pronouncing it. I found uh, a recording done by one of the scientists of one of these places, and that's why I focus on just this one. Tatsi Lake, please again jump in if I know I'm saying it correctly, uh, Northern Finland. So the Tatsi Church, this is what they call the church, is a cliff that falls sharply into the Scourge Lake. The echo there has been part of the Sami tradition for a very, very, very long time. Um, studies are shown that the Tatsi Sierra, again, I'm trying my best, has strong echoes that based on the sound analysis performed is reflected precisely from a certain spot. And so essentially what's happening here is that the sound that is sent out is reflected back from multiple different directions. So it sounds like it's being reflected back in multiple different places, vibrational echoes from different directions. So the rock is perceived as responsive and alive and it was obviously relevant relevant to the rituals that took place there and they leave offerings. This is a very important place to the Sami. Vibratory communication in areas of the earth where the oral, meaning you know, the oral experience is perceivable through our biological capabilities. So essentially this is a place where we can actually hear the earth responding back because often we can't hear, right? We looked at that. There's a very small range that we're capable of hearing. This is actually rather quiet. So you have to kind of listen pretty closely, but this is one of the scientists and their, their work is in the reference section.
Oh yeah, very, very short one. I could not be more excited that people are doing this work because I think that's really gonna open up a lot for us. So here's where I go way out there uh, and get very ethereal, bring it all together. The sonic time machine. I'm gonna sum up, We're coming to the end, no worries. The conscious human experience is limited by a linear perception of time. And that's not a new conversation. So that's been going on for quite a while, right? Time is not linear. That is limiting us. So the advent of phonetic writing, narrator focused to the visual and lost a great deal of our auditory processing. So we, we used to share information vocally, right? Um, but when we started writing, we became very fixated on the visual is what that means. And we sort of lost, we stopped paying attention to sound as much. Sound, especially created by instruments or human voices, becomes a sonification of time and it's not limited to a fixed point. The complex layering of the past, the present, and the future. It allows us to experience transient time. And in this way, ancient sounds transcend it. Right? Sound can help us move through time. Their vibrations transport us to primordial temporal experiences that still linger in our DNA and ripple through the water that Kyrie encases it. There's water that surrounds your DNA and it's rippling through there, much like I was referring to before. Sound is a profound storyteller if we can just remember how to listen. So echoes of the past can be somatically accessed in the present and into the future. Holy sacred places are sites where the universe naturally speaks to us. When we shift our perceptive perception, sorry, when we shift our perspective, I can get there, from the ocular, the eye, to the auditory, we discover deep ancestral gifts that were previously hidden. So this is about listening as well as it is vocalizing. We have to learn to listen, to hear what it is saying back. It can't always be a two by four by a, a waterfall, right? When we shift our, oh, sorry, ocular centricity is what I just said, has been the primary focus of scientific thought and procedure. So primarily we've been analyzing the world through what we can see. And now, as I mentioned, they're starting to do it in a different way. It's also about what we can hear. This is a sum up, but you'll think I'm done. I'm never done. I love this too much. Uh, vibration is a universal language. Sound can create vibrational connections between human and non-human entities. Resonance is a deep connection that allows a shared consciousness, if only for brief moments. Toning and traditional singing practices utilize the human voice to match those frequencies, non-human entities, and manifest that resonance. One thing I forgot to mention, if you'll notice a lot of those living traditions did not use words. These traditional vocal songs enable us to facilitate connection with beings that seem to transcend time, possibly hold threads of experience. We can follow back to find our goal, right? We're trying to follow them back. We're trying to find that sound again. And this is my favorite quote, maybe of all time. Blast the vacuum of empty space hard enough at the right frequency and out will pop a bunch of particles. So this is how significant sound is. In this sense, resonance is responsible for the very existence of particles. And finally, <laughs> my little in my humble opinion, bringing it all together, Resonance is the energetic force that holds together the threads of weird. And our voice utilized through Golder is the way we access that web. And these are my favorites. These are the I didn't make it up slides. Oof, 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 oof. Keeps going. <laughs> I didn't make it up. My partner joked when I did this for him, he actually was thinking the whole time, like, how does she know all this until I got to the end? And I was like five slides later, <laughs> didn't make it up. Whew. I said a lot there, I know. I, <laughs> I really, really love science. I feel like that came across. Wow. 
<laughs> I also was excited when I saw Seagull or what she was going to talk about because I was like, I feel like I'm setting her up. And I, like, we're going to like, she's going to go right into the weird and it's going to be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. C is going to be, well, in, in an hour's time, C is going to be talking about how um, the, the, the weird is created through the Galder and the Volus, but and then and linking that to the present day. So it does link straight into what you've just been saying. Cool. Which is fantastic way of moving on but that yeah that's in about an hour and um, I, I noticed I just wanted to say you you mentioned Runic John I've, I've worked with Runic John for for many mm -hmm. years and one of the things that we used to do not done so much since he's had a heart attacks um it was we would go to quarries and drum and chant in the quarry and then the same with the echo and with the echoes we would then chant those echoes back in the quarry um, and also down to the river and chant chant runes and chant and just chant noises to welcome the the whites of the water into stones and we would take the stones away with the the vibration of those stones so that's something that john's been doing for a long time yeah wonderful but that's just absolutely i'm sure everybody would you know, two fantastic talks up to now everybody would give a massive round of applause that's so interesting and it's great it's i mean i'm not a scientific person but i really like the way you've come from it from a scientific approach and then link into our um you know and link into galda because that's just that's really interesting and gives us lots of food for thought as practitioners. Um, I've we, we we kind of finished, but if there's anybody who would like to um, have a, a, ask a question or say something, please just put your hand up. Um, I will do my best to answer. Or if I if I miss your hand, <laughs> then just um, just say something. I'm going along and see if there are any hands. I can't see any hands. Um, Oh yes, I can see Deborah. Deborah, I can see Deborah's hand in front. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, so, um, when are you publishing the book on all of this? Okay. Well, that. Okay, I get asked that a lot. I actually have, I have been writing a book. I'm working on it. Unfortunately, you don't get paid to write a book, and so you know, finances get wonky, and things have gotten very strange since COVID. So I've had to focus on like you know rent and food, but. We're working on the larger picture, right? Things are very complicated money-wise. It's coming. The word Kickstarter <laughs> is a good word. I have a Patreon where I actually post um, updates and things, and I let my patrons know sort of where I am and, and the newest things. So I can offer that as well. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. See, you had a question. You disappeared, but where are you? I, See, I, I feel like I should talk to her. Yeah. I, I do want to talk to you. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I thought it was brilliant and beautiful. Thank you so much for this. I really, really loved it. Um, and my class, was, my question was really, do you do a class? So yeah, do you do a class? I teach what I call the runic immersion course right now, which is a combination of uh, elder futhark runes, but I mentioned a million other types of runes so that everyone, everyone in America knows they exist because I don't know uh, what's going on in the rest of the world, but they're really focused on just the Elder Futhark. Um, and at the end, we have a Galder section where we sort of work similar to Runic John with the toning of the rune so they can connect to it. But I'm meaning to open up to a larger just Galder class. I think that it's a really important conversation and I think we all need to get together to do it more often together. I'm glad Zoom offers us the ability. It is a little different, of course, than doing it in person. Thank you. Thank you. We work with the Anglo-Saxon um, runes with Runic John, so it's a third. Oh, good. So it is, it's, it's more. Um, uh, one more question. Has anyone got anything else to ask? Or should we have our... No, I can't see any more hands. If you've got anything to say, just shout, because I can't see. Oh, Karina. Of course, I'm not coming anywhere, so... Yeah, Karina. Are... Karina, have you got something to ask? Yes, I've got, it's kind of a weird question, it might seem like a silly question, but I read somewhere that if you want to sit Udaseta, that you shouldn't do it by a waterfall, but I'm wondering, so there, there's the place where I normally uh, do ritual, it's a really lovely park, um, and there's a trail that goes over a creek that runs under the trail, mm -hmm. and it seems to me like, it, it seems to me like, like it's a, a crossroads in a way they're directly perpendicular to each other it's not a waterfall 
would you see a problem with, with sitting Udaseta at that spot? You said it's you just not seem like someone that would be good to ask because, because you know so much about water. <laughs> I do. I like the rivers and the waterfalls. We have a lot in Vermont. They're very cool. Um, so the only thing I could think of is because the waterfall was so loud and really communicated so intensely, it might drown out some of the other messages that might, does that make sense? That's the only mm -hmm. thing I can think of with an issue with that. If someone else, please chime in if you have any. I mean, we, we've done, I've done it to set up by waterfalls yeah. quite a few times. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know where that, that mm -hmm. source is, Karina. I've not seen any problem with it. it I think it may have had something to do with folk with folklore. And I think it might have been like right. a troll them or something like that. They were talking about oh. uh, yeah, well, that water might, spirits might be the being case particularly agitated yeah. at, water, at waterfalls or something along those lines. I mean, I, I don't really know if there's any accuracy in that. It might be the case in I, Iceland, but it might be the geographical landscape as well, because you don't tend to get many mounds by waterfalls. You know, with Uta said, you tend to sit on a mound mm -hmm. or sometimes mm -hmm. in the graveyard. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't tend to get many waterfalls with mines next to. So it, and it might be something linked to Icelandic folklore if it's to do with the trolls. Um, okay. But there's no problem I, I see with it, I wouldn't say. Okay, good. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate that because I'm going to do I'm it. Do it. And then feed back <laughs> to us. Do yeah, it. we want to know what happens. We want to know what experiences <laughs> we've had. Yeah, that could be your talk for next year. <laughs> right, we're really, we're really going to have to just um, take a break now. Now we've got an hour before C speaking. However, Suzanne in the next hour, if anybody wants, is it doesn't want to run off or wants to run off and come quickly back, Suzanne's going to be facilitating some discussions mm -hmm. um, or any questions people have got to ask or anything people want to do. Is that right, Suzanne? Are you there? Uh, yes, I can do. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, so yeah, if you'd you rather, <laughs> you rather stay put and talk shop, I am quite